I'm retired Battalion Chief Larry Cockman, Chairman of the Greensboro Fire Department History Group Committee. The American Fire Service is rich in tradition and culture. A firefighter's life is filled with many emotional highs and lows. Stories of major fires, national disasters, medical calls, firehouse living, and family life are often verbally shared from one generation to another. Many times these stories are lost forever when a firefighter passes away. In an effort to preserve these stories, in 2019, the Greensboro Fire Department History Book Committee launched a new program of recording audio video of our retirees' lives. These stories will be shared on our website, gfhbc.org. In 2020, we did not record because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Please listen as these firefighters share their life experiences with all of us. My full name is Philip Lynn May. I'm 75 years old, which I don't want to be, but I am. And um, I was a captain when I retired. And I had right at 25 years, it liked a few days being 25 years. And I retired on disability. Yeah, I was born and raised in Greensboro my whole life. From the south side of Greensboro. Well, I've lived all over Greensboro, really. But the last time I lived in Greensboro, I had just gotten married, and the next day I bought a house in Ashboro. Related to any other fireman, I, my brother was a fireman, and I don't know the year, but it was a long time before I was. And they called him, he had a nickname, they called him for some reason, they called him Bino. And a lot of the old timey people knew, knew him as Bino. Of course, most of them all are gone like he is. His name was Kenneth May. You wanted to know what I was doing before I came on the fire department. I was in, when I got out of high school, I joined the Army as a, and wanted to, they, they actually drafted me and I, told them I was going to sign up for what I wanted, and uh, this is how smart I was. I wanted infantry airborne, and I wanted to be a, a Green Beret. <laughs> I'm sure the guy in the front office said, probably said, we got a real winner out here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I got infantry airborne, and right before I was going to be, go to jump, the jump, uh, Green Beret School, uh, the Vietnam was getting heated up, and I'm sure that's why, but they went ahead and sent the whole 101st Airborne to Vietnam at one time. It was a big airlift, 10,000 of us. I stayed in Vietnam. Uh, you want to know how long, long I was in war? I was actually in war 13 months. And I volunteered to stay for an extra month because if you stayed 13 months, or if you came home with less than, I think it was less than three months, you were automatically terminated from the military. And I, I'd had enough of it by then, and I, so I'd changed right, within a few months of that, I'd changed it to where I would stay an extra month and I'd come home with less than 150 days. And I got out. I went to give. I went to work. After that, I went to work to Gil Barco at Gil Barco, and the best I can remember, I worked there about three or four years. And then some firemen started talking to me about the fire department. You want to know if it helped me to be a better fire fireman? It, it helped me to direct me, and and, and uh, actually, I could give commands pretty good. <laughs> uh, they didn't always follow them, but I was good at giving direction. The process for, you asked me about the process for the training division, it was pretty simple back then. You, you would laugh at it if you saw it today. We all wore t-shirts and blue jeans, our own clothes. They didn't even give us anything to wear. And, uh, they kind of picked me, Chief Powell, kicked, uh, he was the chief of the department then. He picked me, he just said, I come up there and said, my brother used to work with you. 
and told him about my brother. And uh, he said, well, I remember being there, I'm going to hire you. So it's kind of the reason I got hired, maybe, I don't know. But he asked me when I could go to work. They were getting ready to start a class. And I said, well, I have to give a, a two-week notice at Kilmarca. That's just what I, I'm not going to quit somebody and not give them a notice. And he, he said, that'd be fine. Yeah, it was a lot. My starting salary uh, back then, and Bob McLean, he, he was in my class. He swears it was less than this. He said it was 400 and something. But I'm almost positive it was $581 a month. Well, some of the other people that were in my class were, uh, they're still living. <laughs> they're not all living. Uh, one of them is, uh, he was out there at the state dinner last night. Two of them were sharp in. And, and old Bill Smith was there. It's the first time I'd seen him. I saw him last night. Him and his wife were there together. And wives don't usually come, but uh, that was good to see. I, I met her and saw Bill. Uh, anything happened that was funny during my training class was I'm ha having trouble remembering some names, yep. but there was one guy, and he, he ended up quitting over the Palm Pier ladder. Is that that ladder with the one single beam? And he started climbing, climbing up that building, <laughs> and uh, the thing went sideways on him, and he was hanging this way instead of this way. And uh, we finally got him straightened out, hanging down, and he went back down, and he said, I'm not going to do this. I don't want to be a fireman. There was another guy that's going to uh, climb a uh, Bangor ladder. And when he got up so high, it kind of started kicking a little bit with him. He's not smooth, wasn't a smooth climber. And he, they brought me up there, Chief Osborne brought me up there and he said, watch me climb this ladder. <laughs> and it was just the way I, but I'd been climbing ladders my whole life. And it's just the way I climbed it. He said, this foot up and this foot up, this foot up and this foot up. And I, that's the way I did it automatically. And a lot of them are having trouble just climbing a ladder. The Bangor ladder is a 50 foot ladder. It's got, we don't hardly ever use them anymore. I don't know if they use them at all now. I would doubt it because they're a little bit dangerous. They've got poles that are, I'm trying to think what that's called. It's uh well, what it's called is hooked onto them that's a pole to keep, it's supposedly to keep it balanced. I never used but one, one, one time in a, a Bangor ladder, but one time in, actually in, during a fire. It was climb on, a, climb on a roof up on Lee Street, I'll never forget it. And I sent, I was in charge, I was <coughs> riding uh, captain even though I wasn't, <laughs> I was in charge and I, I sent, uh, wait just a minute, I'll tell you their names. One of, well, one of them's a chief now, still on the department, Brent Gerald. I'm going to tell you a little bit about who my first captain was and my first assignment on the fire department. And believe it or not, there was three of us and we were the last three in the whole fire department to do this. We were sent, no, there was four of us. And I can, I can still remember who they were and name them. And I was sent, I was picked to go to Station 5, and it, there was a transfer coming up, and I, I was going to be on that, when that transfer came up, I was going to be on it. I went to Station 5 over at Friendly Avenue, where the, uh, I think it's a restaurant or a hair, hair salon place now. Uh, I went over there with uh, on the engine company with uh, Horace Browning. He had a reputation for being a bad captain, but I don't know if he was or not. I wasn't with him long enough to find out. He never was mean to me or nothing. But I tell you what, there was a crew over there. I mean, they were something else. It's one of they didn't burn that station down where they smoked in bed. 
and uh, I'm not going to tell you who they were because they they been, they've been long gone. They all quit for some reason. Every one of them I remember quit. Maybe it's because I went over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, it was very shortly after that I was transferred to station. Well, I was, I didn't say I'd never been through training. They showed us how to put on an air pack. That's all they showed us. And then they said, stay close to your cat and do what he tells you to do. Well, on that fire, it was over on, uh, it was on that street that goes out to the Fireman's Club. Air Harbor. No, it was the long, the long one going Longdale. out. Longdale. Longdale, it was right in town, close to the crossing of Sears, where that Sears Mirror used to be. And uh, it was just a kitchen fire. And Horace told me, he said, go out there to the truck and ask him for a fan. And I got a fan, and me and another guy carried it up there and put it in a window and just to get smoke out. And that was my first, uh, any kind of fire call that I had. And then uh, after that we went through training. They sent us through training. The best I can remember of the weeks of training that we had was, it was either eight or ten, it wasn't many. And they, they rushed us through pretty fast. And we wore, we wore a lot of our own clothes in the smokehouse because we wore our own blue jeans, tennis shoes, and I think the first thing they gave us some, some old wore out boots or something they might have gave us. It wasn't long after that they started coming out with uniforms and t-shirts that they let us wear. And I was always hot natured, so I, I'd wear the t-shirt any chance I got. Well, uh, some of the guys that gave me a nickname that was uh, Brooks Langley. He was one of the other ones that went through training with no with no training class. We went on the truck with no training class. Brooks Langley used to say, "Get the horse to do it," and they always called me horse. And I was strong back then. I, I'm not now. But back then I was pretty strong and they'd always say, get the horse to do it. Let's see, some of the pranks and stuff we done on the fire department. They were always pulling pranks down there at Station 11. It was called Animal House. And uh, I wasn't much of a prankster. I just don't like to pull jokes on people. But I'd let them get away with it and they could all laugh about it. But they were terrible to tie people up in the bed if they snored, where they couldn't get out. And uh, I remember one time they were talking this at the, at the talking about this at the uh, steak dinner the other night. Frank Fortune, they tied poor Frank to his bed and wrapped a tarp around him, and he about couldn't breathe. And they, I told him, I said, that's gone far enough, no more, no more, no tarp wrapping on the beds where people can't get loose. And there were other ones, they loved firecrackers and uh, throwing smoke bombs and firecrackers in the bathroom on you. Uh, now we, me and, me and Bobby Taylor are down there, I love Bobby Taylor to death, he's like a brother. He actually, he was actually my third cousin, and I hate it when somebody killed him. But Bobby was, he was, he looked, he was good to everybody. And Bobby and Bobby and me would get stuff that people wouldn't eat, like like pig's feet and uh, raw oysters and stuff like that, and do them at the table, and it make it makes some of them guys about sick. And, uh, but we'd eat all that mess like that. And we love pig's feet and raw oysters. And I was trying to think of some of the other stuff we ate. Yes, we cooked. We cooked, uh, our crew cooked and ate together all the time. There was a, sometimes there'd be a guy that would say, I'm not gonna eat that mess y'all eat because we would eat somewhat unhealthy. Like on certain days there would be, like the squad, there was a squad there at 11 and the engine company and a truck company. And on a full day, there was 10 people there, but it usually wasn't full. And we'd rotate somebody off the truck company or the engine company 
onto the squad. I even rode the squad some. I didn't like it because I didn't like rescue calls, but I just hated to see young people getting hurt, and uh, especially Rex. And I seen a lot of that in Vietnam, you know, blood and stuff. I just didn't care for it no more. Uh, but <laughs> we got one one guy, black fireman, he was going to give it a try. He said, boy, y'all make them things look good in them raw oysters. I said, they're out of this world. I said, one time, I ate 50 at one time. And uh, he said, ain't no way. I said, I really did. I've got proof that I did it. I could fry a better chicken than in Kentucky fried. I can fry the best. I, uh, people want to know if I was a good cook on the fire department. They begged me to cook my chicken. And I could buy, back then, I could buy about, I never did buy breast. If anybody wanted a breast, they had to buy it theirself, and I'd cook it for them. But everybody wanted my dark chicken, my legs and wings. Not legs and wings, legs and uh, thighs. And I could thaw them things. I, I skinned every piece. I didn't cook it with no skin on it. And that's why where these fried places mess up, trying to cook chicken with the skin on it, it's just not good. It's greasy. And I could I cooked uh, 75 one day. I had to start three hours early, and I would put it in. Bobby Taylor knew how to fold these papers, the, the newspapers that the bag, bag that groceries come in. But he could fold them, slide them, make a tray out of it. They used them for a lot of stuff, fish and things like that, but I'd, I'd pile up about six or eight paper towels on the bottom so it would suck every bit of that grease up. And I'd put them in there as I'd cook them. And I had a certain temperature, I, I can't remember none of that now. I doubt if I could cook them now. I've been tempted to try because I miss them. And uh, anyway, they fought over them, uh, and if and if there was any left at night, they'd sneak, you'd catch them sneaking in there in the refrigerator, eating them cold. And there usually wasn't none left in the morning. If it was, Brooks Langley got up early and went in there and got them. <laughs> Pigged out on them. I think they're, uh, th uh, the cubicles, as far as uh, making them, whether they're better like that or about like we used to have it, where it was just open uh, bedroom, and everybody's bed was there. I don't know why they would want private cubicles. I thought it was fun. Of course, we had a pool table right in the middle of that the, the bed, the beds, and we get in there and play pool. And uh, it, and sometimes we was playing pool during the classroom when we weren't supposed to be. So. That definitely made it more fun. And uh, some of them, you look over there, they'd be asleep taking a nap. And I couldn't sit down long, I'd be taking a nap. And Bobby Taylor was going to take a nap no matter where he was at. Even if the chief was there, he, he'd take a nap anyway. He's just known for taking a nap in the evening. But I don't see, I don't see much. I'd have to hear them say why they like the cubicles better. So I just don't see it. I can see it for having women separate, you know, have a cubicle for them if they wanted it. I don't think they'd want to be in there hearing some of the racket some of the men make. You don't know if I see any value in uh, families coming to the fire station. I thought that was nice for to have certain days they would come and visit. Uh, I think they should have. Uh, back at our station, we had to we had to uh, let them. Like if somebody say one of the girls wanted to go to the bathroom, of course we didn't have women's facilities in, back then, and so we'd have to have somebody watch it for them and close it off for for that. Why well, it was important for active duty firemen to spend some time with the retirees that come by the station. Well, I used to go by once in a while, but I knew some of them. And I'd go by and sit and talk with them, and we'd all sit there, and they, they seemed to enjoy it, and I did too. 
but it's gotten to where now I've been gone so long, I don't know any of them. And uh, it's almost like you're bored with me coming in. It seems like it is to me. I, I don't, I don't, I probably never gave them a chance. But, uh, some farmer will call you and want you to come eat hot dogs with them. I got asked that last night at the state dinner to come to Seven. I haven't seen Station Seven. Of course, I moved to Ashboro. And I'd like to see the station. And they said, you can slide the pole. And I said, I don't know if I can still slide a pole. They said, well, you can ride an elevator. And I said, you got an elevator? And they said, yeah. I couldn't believe it. So I'll probably go by there one day. He's setting up a day. Uh, I can't remember that date. Was uh, a date for a fireman to come by there and have hot dogs at Station Seven. Uh, my first call that I ever went on was on. I thought we talked about that already. It was uh, the one on uh, not Battleground, but uh, Longdale. Longdale. It was an okay. apartment fire, yeah. and somebody had been cooking on the stove. They loved to, it seemed like they loved to, certain groups of people just loved to start cooking and go lay down. They loved to cook, lay down, drink, have them a few drinks of liquor or something, whatever, get about half lit, and it makes them sleepy, and so they go to sleep and just let it burn. And then they get woke up rudely. I had for them probably more of them than any calls there were. Uh, smoke on the stove. On our medical crew, we answered fire calls and medical calls. Uh, I didn't care for medical calls. I, I think I've told you that. I, I'll never forget one out there where the headquarters of the, of the I think they're still there of the ambulance services out there on Headquarters Drive, and, uh, right at the interstate. And right in front of that building, a tractor trailer had hit a car, a Volvo, and I opened the front door. It was me and Eddie Nix was in, on that call. It was an old rescue truck. I mean, they were old. I like to have one of them now for a souvenir. <coughs> and, uh, but a 65 Chevrolet truck is what it was, a van truck. And it, if you weren't careful going around the curve, it had so much junk on it, equipment, that was supposed to be important. It feel like it was going to lean and turn over. But we stopped down there and I opened that door of that truck. And, and it had a floorboard in it about that deep, and it was full of blood. They, they bled out. It was a man and woman in the front seat. It bled out, and two little kids were in the back seat. I'll never forget that. <laughs> I never wanted to ride it again. I understand. But it just bothered me seeing them little kids hollering for Mama and Daddy, and neither one of them were going to answer. Of major alarm fires. There was one downtown now that was a, I can't remember the name of that building, but it, I looked at it today coming up here. I said, they've totally tore that old house down. There's a big giant two-story house up there on Church Street, right there in town, right there where the, used to be, I think, a Bell, what was that, Bell, and Southern Bell was in that building up there, and there was a giant two-story White House. And we went out there and it was snowing like crazy. And they had to send two trucks over. The, the hydrants were fire, were freezing. And so we was having a hard time even getting any water there. And we finally got one that broke loose and goes from pretty much burn it to the ground. It, 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 it wasn't nobody in it, it was an empty building. And they think some uh, homeless people had gone in there and caused it. I had moved uh, on 9-11, uh, the way that affected me, uh, I had moved to Virginia, I was living up there by myself, I divorced and was up there by myself and my daughter rang the cell phone and I picked it up and she said, are you watching TV? I said, no I'm not. And she said, well turn it on. 
one of the main news channels. And so I don't know which one I turned it on, but it was it was showing that. And them buildings being flown into. I just could, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I couldn't help but puddle up a little bit watching that. And I said, they got nerve attacking America. We'll get them for this. Uh, some of the people I looked up to that meant her to me was, uh, it wasn't necessarily the chiefs, uh, as far as the big chiefs. I always thought they got away with doing nothing, <laughs> which is a good job. If you've worked your way up to it, it's a good job to have. You don't have to work no more. I mean, there's things you have to do, but you're not going to get dirty. <laughs> It more than likely. And uh, I was trying to think of, for some reason I looked up to my brother because he'd been, he was known for driving. They said he drove the service truck and answered the whole city, just him. I said, well, he couldn't have been just him. It had to be three of them because they had shifts. But no, sometimes they didn't run it if he wasn't there. They said he could drive a fool out of that thing. I don't know what it was. It was a big truck called a service truck. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't know what it was. Well, I thought the world of Roland Scott, uh, Captain Scott. He was he was he was just kind of a hard-headed man, but what he said went. And it usually was right. And uh, I was trying to think of anybody else up there. I was at Station One, you know. Uh, as far as challenging during my career and not liking to do it, I did not like to train, uh, be a training officer. I wouldn't want to sit in front of somebody and teach a class. I just wasn't good in front of people, groups of people. It almost cost me my job one time, I think, because I was going to quit over it. <laughs> and they worked it out. The, the two of the chiefs worked it out. I guess I should thank a lot of them for doing it, but, uh, and I, I do thank the world of them for doing it. Probably the most heartbreaking moment on the fire department was uh, probably when I saw those children wanting their mom and daddy in the back of that car, and they, their mom and daddy was in the front seat dead with all the blood and floor. Maybe it's my proudest moment is I'm not a bragger. Yeah, well, <laughs> Uh, but I don't know uh, uh, as far as Vietnam and how I dealt with death and stuff. Well, that uh, that one with them two little children I, that'll never leave my mind. I mean, uh, it really bothered me, and uh, I think it bothered Eddie too. But Eddie continued to go on emergency calls and rescue calls. And I just told them I preferred not to do it no more after that. But Vietnam, you just learn to take it. Uh, somebody's going to die. It's either going to be them or us. And you learn to try to shoot straight. I was a good rifle shot, real good. I, 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 was fought, I fired expert with my pistol and the machine gun and uh, AR-15. And uh, I could use it. I could hit what I was aiming at. I usually didn't miss, and I learned how to keep my head down and keep my helmet on. And uh, I'm sure my helmet had been greased, greased, or I don't know what you'd call it, touched a time or two on the outside, but never went in it. It had to be a direct hit to go in one of those helmets. You know, well, I could even shoot a, I could shoot, shoot a bazooka and a, what they call an AR, uh, I can't remember the name of that one. It was, it was yeah. a little old thing, kind of like a bazooka, but it was short. Law, called a law. As far as losing a, a, a fireman or a firefighter uh, in the service even, you know, it hurts you, but in the fire department, it's not expected as much. And we had some guys commit suicide. Uh, and both of them had been at my station and were sent over to Station 10. 
would I become a firefighter uh, and would I change anything? Uh, yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably become a firefighter. I might not would be so outspoken and get in so much trouble <laughs> with with my upper echelon, the, my, the bosses, because sometimes I said things that I should have just kept my mouth shut. See, I had sick time. I had a soldier surgery. I said a rotator cuff surgery, a back surgery, and I was using my sick time. I'd already planned to go out to leave, but I was going to use my sick time instead of getting paid for it. And uh, he come to me one day and said, "We need to. We need your position to promote somebody." And I said, "Well, if it's worrying you so bad, I'll go ahead and leave." and get my sick pay. But I should have stuck it out and told him, said, you try to fire me with me having sick leave, see what happens. As far as being a fireman today, I couldn't do it today. They're, they're a lot smarter than I am. I, I said, now, I, I was the first firefighter below the rank of captain to get a fire science degree from, uh, what's the school? GTC. GTCC. And I got it the same year that J.W. Maynard got his. He was already a captain. But I was below the rank of captain when I got mine. The one of the most successful and, and the, the one I'd point at today is sitting in this room. It's not you. Well, I know that. <laughs> He's right there. Huh? He, he, he just knows how to talk to people. He's got a genuine and he can, he can make you laugh if you, even when you don't want to. And what's his name? Dwayne Church. He's one of the best people I've ever met in my life. Attributes to have to be on a fire department. I think you need to be outgoing. Uh, you need to be able to control your temper. Uh, that's one thing I had problems with. <laughs> um, just to be an outgoing person and be friendly. Always, uh, the, what I'd like my family to re remember about me is that I always tried to provide for them. <laughs> I know she can't argue with that. I gave her about 17 cars. And uh, I don't know if she would say that's enough or not. <laughs> <laughs> and I gave a brand new one when I left uh, or to remarry. I gave a brand new Toyota Camry had 12,000 miles on it, to my granddaughter. I didn't give one to my grandson, but he wasn't driving yet. I gave him my boat, my fishing boat. Of course, it needed some work done on it, but and you'd have to dedicate yourself to it, but it was a fun boat to fish out of, a little bass boat. Well, the fire department, I'd like for them to remember about me is I used to try to try to teach the guys the best I could from doing the, doing the job with their hands, not not necessarily reading out of a book. Even though I did believe in getting an education, I got that first uh, fire science degree, and I made straight A's during that. I didn't know I'd do it fairly good in high school. But I made straight A's and B's, never lower than a B, and uh, even took trigonometry. And I couldn't even tell you what trigonometry is now. And made a B in that. But just as I tried to do my job. In closing, the Greensboro Firefighters History Book Committee hopes you have gained a greater insight into the dangers, the challenges, and emotional events that have influenced and shaped the American firefighter.